And right now, there are no costs for the, and here I'm going to be against cancel culture. There are no fundamental costs for the punitive, nasty, shaming, uh, unforgiving pieces of cancel culture. And forgiveness, if you're going to have canceling, you have to have forgiveness. And right now, there is no forgiveness in the culture at all. Good evening, and welcome to the ninth season of the Jonathan Sayman Hot Buttons Cool Conversations series. I'm Mark Sokol, President and CEO of JCC Greater Boston. This acclaimed series invites a panel of distinguished public figures to engage in conversation around controversial subjects of concern to the Jewish community and well beyond. Our panelists are always guided and challenged by an expert moderator. Our hallmark is respectful difference of opinion and a commitment to civil dialogue. We are thrilled once again to partner with the folks at WGBH Forum Network for tonight's program entitled Cancel Culture Through a Jewish Lens. Whether it's Dr. Seuss or Mr. Potato Head, allegations of cancel culture seem to pervade recent headlines. Fueled by social media, cancel culture has earned a consistent spot on the news cycle this past year. What exactly is cancel culture? Tonight, we will explore definitions of cancel culture and dive in together to examine the phenomenon. We will highlight some recent examples, discuss its benefits and its dangers. All of this through the words and wisdom of our distinguished panel. Rabbi Erwin Kula is the seventh generation rabbi meaning he decided to stay in the family business. He is co-president of CLAU, the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership. Erwin is a spiritual leader and independent thinker committed to making Jewish a public good. Andrew Rafeld is president of Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, the Leadership Development Center of Reform Judaism. He was previously a professor of political science at Washington University and the president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of St. Louis. And finally, Kathy Young. Kathy is the author of Growing Up in Moscow, Memories of a Soviet Girlhood. She is a respected journalist who has written extensively about cancel culture. We are thrilled to welcome them all to our virtual JCC tonight. I am also very excited to welcome our moderator for the evening, Rachel Fish. Rachel was the founding executive director of the Foundation to Combat Antisemitism, an important initiative of our friend, Robert Kraft. Rachel is an expert on Israeli history, Zionist thought, and Middle Eastern studies. She served as the executive director of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis University. Now it is my sincere pleasure to turn things over to our moderator, Rachel Fish. Rachel. Thank you so much, Mark. It is truly a pleasure to be with our esteemed panelists and to have a chance to think together with all of you and learn about the ideas surrounding cancel culture. As you heard from Mark, whether it's Dr. Seuss, Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben, Mr. Potato Head, the Redskins, actors and actresses, writers, intellectuals, and even some rabbis, as we all know, cancel culture as a concept is one that exists within our society in the 21st century. The idea that a person can be canceled, or in other words, culturally blocked from having a prominent public platform or career has become quite a polarizing debate. The rise of cancel culture and the idea of canceling someone coincides with a familiar pattern. A celebrity or another public figure does or says something that is deemed offensive. There's a public backlash often fueled by social media. Then comes the call to cancel. To cancel that person means to effectively end that individual's career or revoke their cultural cachet, whether through boycotts or the work of some disciplinary action from an employer. Cancel culture is not about disagreeing with one another, but it personalizes that criticism and seeks to engage in humiliation and ultimately punishment. So a working definition that we'll put out there for our panelists to engage with, perhaps build upon or deconstruct, is that cancel culture or call out culture is a modern form of ostracism in which someone is thrust out of social or professional circles 
whether it be online or in real life, and those subject to this ostracism are said to have been canceled. Now, we know that this is happening. We see it happening on a daily basis, whether it's in the news, whether it's in our social media feeds, whether it's on the blogs that we read. And what I'd like to begin is by asking Kathy, if you can begin this conversation for us by the, answering the question, who is the individual or who is responsible? Who, to whom are we accountable in this conversation around cancel culture? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, clearly, there is no specific individual. Uh, and this is what uh, I, I find really fascinating, but also kind of scary about uh, this moment, because uh, there is, I think, a culture that definitely has an authoritarian uh, streak in which uh, people can be, as you said, you know, canceled or ostracized. Um, at the same time, there is no central authority. Uh, I mean, people have made some interesting parallels, including myself, which obviously can be overstated, but people have made parallels, for instance, to the sort of totalitarian culture of the Soviet Union in which everyone was expected to subscribe to this single ideology. And if you descended from it or even didn't express support for it uh, vocally enough, uh, you could basically be written out of society. And uh, that was sort of the end of your career. Oh, of course, you could also be sent to prison. But a lot of the time it was enforced really more through that sort of ostracism where, you know, the if you were a writer, for instance, since you couldn't get published. If you were a university professor, you could get fired and reduced to working as a truck driver, that sort of thing. The difference, obviously, today is that there is no central authority. There is no you know, equivalent of the Communist Party that is enforcing this orthodoxy. Instead, it's this very diffuse um, very large network uh, that exists, you know, mainly in the social media, but also through some of the kind of progressive traditional media uh, that, um, you know, informally enforces the system of call outs. Um, very often, it's something that sort of spontaneously builds as a kind of flash mob, so to speak. Um, very often it can be based on a misreported uh, remark uh, taken out of context. Uh, and, uh, you know, yet it can in some cases uh, pretty effectively end someone's career, even if the record is later set straight. So uh, I, I think I, I really find it interesting that in discussions of cancel culture, some of the people who are sort of defending the system are basically saying, well, it isn't cancel culture, it's accountability culture. But that, that's a really good question that you ask, you know, to whom are we accountable? And if there are people who are you know, holding other people accountable, you know, who appointed them to that position? I mean, who voted for them to be the, you know, accountability holder in chief? So, you know, I, I think that is a great, great question. And um, I hope we delve deeper into that. Thank you, Kathy. Erwin, let me, let me ask you, I guess sort of building on what Kathy's saying, is this cancel culture new? Is it a new phenomena? And how does this, um, you know, the, the use of social media impact the spread of the idea around cancel culture? Yeah, well, also good question. Um, look, I, I don't think shaming, sh a shaming culture and, and cancel culture and shaming culture, there's a, a, a big overlap in the Venn diagram between those two is nothing new. I mean, we've always had cancel culture. Um, uh, a cancel culture was a staple of Puritanism and, uh, you know, the early pilgrims. And today it's common in a lot of religious communities and, and, and a lot of spaces. I think the other thing is powerful people have always canceled less powerful people whose views upset or threaten them. You know, the prophets were canceled in their time. And, and it turns out that, that what is new here is less powerful people are canceling powerful people. And that's a very unnerving thing for powerful people. We have, uh, uh, Kathy made a, a good point about accountability. There's a lot of what I call pent up demand for accountability amongst um, everybody with power. 
right? All different forms of elite who have really, if you think about it over the last 20 years, failed in so many in the economic sphere, in the political sphere, in the military sphere, in the religious sphere. And so there's a lot of pent up demand for accountability. And then you bring in the capacity of social media and technology to disintermediate all authorities. And all of a sudden, people who never had a voice, marginalized voices, um, now have a voice. And it's like, you know, it's like the first time you can speak, the, it's not surprising that there's going to be a, a sort of unbelievable excess. This is like a very, very, very hot fire. It's like, it's like learning how to use fire the first time. And so there's a literacy involved in it. There's a, that's of the technology. There's a, so there's a lot of we's also in this. There's the, the real necessity to change norms, which is happening. And that's always messy. And then I think the other thing is we shouldn't exaggerate the cancel culture. I mean, very few people have been canceled. And the vast majority of people who we've heard have been canceled have wound up better post being canceled. And whether that, you know, Kevin Hart is fine and, and Kanye West is fine and, and Taylor Swift is fine and Barry Weiss is fine and Andrew Sullivan is fine and, and, and Andrew Weinstein from university is fine. And in fact, many of these people, because America is so crazy, have, are making a, have more voice post being canceled. And I think that there's an exaggeration regarding cancel culture. And here's the most serious point for me is that the consensus that many of us have benefited and here I'm one of those, those us, whether we're white, whether we're male, whether we're whatever, whatever power in the, that we benefit from the consensus, that's going to be distributed. That is going to be redistributed. And who, that, who wants power to be redistributed? And cancel culture is, is it's an excessive, somewhat toxic, initial piece of this redistribution in America of power. Thank you, Erwin. And I definitely want to come back to, to some of the points you raised because you highlighted some very well-known individuals who may have experienced or will have said that they have experienced forms of cancel culture. But I know, for example, many graduate students, many faculty who have said, if I speak about certain topics, and this is gonna go in your direction, Andrew, particularly about Israel, then I won't be asked to be published in certain presses. And I won't be asked to speak in certain um, conferences. And whether, it's or whether or not actual cancel culture will happen, there is a self-censorship that then it, um, begins. And it's a process that slowly chips away at the Overton window. And what I mean here by the Overton window is this idea that, you know, there's an acceptable sort of window here of ideas that society recognizes. And it feels as if that window um, is shrinking in terms of what viewpoints, what ideas, what speech is considered acceptable within the mainstream discourse. So I, I would, you know, have you think about that, but I'm going to go to Andrew first, because I wonder, from your perch, specifically looking at this um, within the framework of the Jewish communal conversation, Andrew, how you see this issue of cancel culture impacting Jewish communal discourse. Thank you, Rachel. And let me just begin by saying thank you for having us and for convening these conversations to Mark to the JCC in Boston. What a wonderful opportunity to really speak broadly and freely. Uh, and, um, and, and I'm grateful for it. Uh, and I also want to just begin, uh, Rachel, I'll get to the point about faculty and, and discourse in the Jewish community in a second, but begin by adding to the positives of cancel culture and what it means to follow up Irwin. Uh, there are two parts of cancel culture. One is the canceling, but the other is what is it we're canceling? And the stuff that is being ri risen up, what Kathy has articulated as accountability or what she doesn't want to confuse, nevertheless, are a set of values that are really strong. Not abusing power, not harassing women, not abusing women or, or uh, people of gay, lesbian, et cetera, uh, for sexual orientation. So these are, these are good things. And th the values that are changing, that are raising up is really positive. So I want to begin with that. But I also want to say, to differentiate a little bit from Irwin, I don't think this is about um, those out of power 
uh, holding those in power to account or to canceling. And I agree, it's not a big deal if that's the dynamic you're looking at. I think it is much more about the social fabric to Rachel's point and in the Jewish community, what it's doing to the Jewish community itself. John Stuart Mill in the 19th century wrote a famous book on on liberty. And he noted that the biggest chilling effect in our society does not come from government, it comes from social norms. And in that sense, cancel culture is simply what we're labeling a whole set of ideas that have been with us in American society for a while. Think about the anti-communism in, uh, uh, in McCarthy's time or uh, how gays and lesbians were shunned, not just by people in power and out of power, but by everyone. That is, they were socially uh, 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 put aside. So we're labeling something anew. Now, in terms of the Jewish communal conversation, I think the first thing to note is that we have to separate behavioral canceling from ideological canceling. That is, we cancel people for things that they've done, and particularly with the Me Too movement about harassment and particularly against women, but not exclusively. Uh, and that's different from the ideological canceling, which is what we'll get to. On the behavioral canceling, I'll just note it's very interesting that the behaviors that we cancel are mostly around sexual conduct now, that fiscal impropriety and other kinds of ethical impropriety don't get the kind of reaction, even though, quite frankly, they often harm many, many more people without undermining at all or minimizing the harms of the sexual impropriety. So it's just to put a pin in that. Now to get to your question, you see, like a good professor, I weave until I finally get to the point. So here's the point. Um, the ideological cancel culture is affecting uh, the Jewish communal conversation in two ways. Number one, it has for the last 20, 30, maybe 40 years, but particularly since the turn of the century, um, it put a chill on Israel. If you are a Jewish communal professional, you cannot say certain words like the word occupation you can't say. You can't say words that are offensive. Uh, uh, to, to folks because they seem to signal an anti-Israel bias. And from an ideological point of view, that means we can't engage people. We're shunning people out. A new generation is coming up asking questions about Israel that we don't allow them in because of the language they use to enter into the conversation. I don't agree with many of them, just to be clear. I'm not passing judgment on whether you agree or don't agree, but the cancellation happens with the language that they're using. So that's coming from the right and that's been there for a very long time. On the other hand, on the left, what I'm seeing within the Jewish community right now is a rising uh, cancel culture around issues of how do we attack racism and that we have to uh, uh, use language of an anti-racist um, uh, movement and white privilege and things like that. And if you don't accept those orthodoxies, you can be canceled as well. Again, I'm not taking an issue on which side you agree with. I'm just saying that the language itself creates this kind of chill that, that, that is detrimental to learning, it's detrimental to engaging. And in that way, I really disagree, I think, with Erwin, maybe exaggerating for the sake of this conversation. I don't think this is a blip. I don't think it's a minor thing. I think it's important that we're addressing it and talking about it because it's affecting the very way that we're thinking about the problems that we have to, to address as a community. Yeah, I, I don't want to say that, I don't want to say, I was doing one side of it and, and there's a piece of what Andrew says that I agree, but, but there's no we Jewish community anymore in the same way that it was. And that's part of the thing that makes it difficult to be whatever we mean by a Jewish professional. Just like in America, the we, the people, is undergoing a tremendous redefinition. And in that redefinition, in that trying to figure out who we are again, we shouldn't be surprised that everything is happening. There is both uh, an attempt to cancel and constrain, generally speaking, by different sorts of extremes, or a mainstream that is no longer as mainstream as it imagined. And, at the, and, and on the other hand, there are more voices. There are more, let me do it in, this, in terms of Jewish community. There are more voices and organizations around whatever we mean by opposition to the, uh, than, than the, the occupation than ever before in American in the last, in, since the start of Israel. So the weird thing is, and by the way, that's the same on, on the right. We have more possibility. What has changed is, is if you are trying to make a living in the mainstream of any community, it's very, very, it's much more complicated. And in that respect, it would behoove whoever imagines they are in the mainstream 
to figure out how to widen and live in a pluralist community. And I would say, here's where the fundamental failure of the we, the community, the communal we is fundamentally not pluralist or what it needs to be is to widen its understanding of pluralism. And if it doesn't do that, then the cancel culture is just, it's, it's not that it's a blip, it's, it's one way to sort of rearrange the deck in a moment in which the table and the deck needs to be rearranged. Of course, it's nasty. And of course, it constrains conversation. And of course, it's toxic for some people, though even the people for whom it's, it, it cancels them, there is, it's very hard to cancel. It's really big. Their voice isn't amplified anymore the same way. It's very hard to cancel a voice in the United States of America, or for that matter, in the Jewish community, to cancel the voice completely. And the fact is, there are more voices than ever before. And I don't think we know how to manage that as a communal effort, just like America does. Our Congress does. The Congress is like the Jewish community. We don't know how to manage the center anymore because it's not holding because it, it needs to be recentered. So, so I want to take this idea of speech for a minute because now Erwin's mentioned it, Andrew, you've mentioned it. And I actually want to focus that idea of how we evaluate speech and have our you know, writer on our panelists address that particular question, Kathy, because speech, obviously language can be used in order to promote certain political positions, certain ideological positions. It can be used to demarcate what's in bounds and what's beyond the bounds. Right. And, and I'm interested in your perspective here about how do we evaluate speech in this particular context? Right, well, one thing that I find really interesting, the, uh, the, the progressive ideology that is kind of currently dominant, I would say, on the cultural left, the sort of social justice ideology, actually attaches a tremendous importance to speech and to speech policing, so to speak, because the, the idea that is very prevalent is that speech plays a central role in the sort of reproduction of social injustice, uh, you know, by enforcing certain social norms. Uh, and because of that, there is this tremendous attention to, you know, speech and discussion, but the, the really kind of toxic part of that is that it leads to the idea that, um, you know, you're literally perpetuating or perpetrating oppression and inequality if you use the wrong kind of language. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, th there's a lot of this happening in the, uh, you know, around issues of transgender equality. And that I think is an interesting issue because this is an issue on which in some ways, there is a lot of dissension within the LGBT community. Uh, you know, there are, for instance, um, gays and lesbians today who feel that they are being pressured into, you know, accepting someone as a sexual partner who identifies as male but actually has you know, female genitalia. And, and a lot of people will say that you can't even use the term female genitalia because, you know, that's inherently oppressive because, you know, if someone who has that set of genitalia identifies as male, uh, you know, they should be regarded as a male with no questions asked. And, you know, there's this whole debate about, you know, are you as a lesbian, for instance, are you being transphobic if you reject out of hand and a partner with a penis who identifies as female. So there is that, and again, you know, is it even permissible to use the word male anatomy? So th this is really not, I would sort of dispute the idea that this is about, uh, you know, the traditionally marginalized versus the traditionally powerful, because a lot of this is actually happening within historically marginalized communities. And, um, the, the, the wars in the LGBT community over the transgender issues really do get pretty ugly. I mean, there have been some incidents of physical violence, so, you know, and, uh, uh, and so on. There was, uh, you know, I think last year there was a rape crisis center in Canada 
that was covered with the you know, really disgusting graffiti because they had a policy of not admitting, uh, you know, people whom they consider to be biological males, i.e., you know, it's transgender women who do have like, intact male anatomy. So, you know, again, I, I think it's a little simplistic to say that this is about the marginalized versus the powerful. A lot of this is happening, uh, you know, again, within marginalized communities. And a lot of this does have to do with the sort of policing of language. Uh, there is all these debates, for instance, about cultural appropriation. Like, when is it uh, inherently offensive, uh, for instance, to create certain forms of art uh, when you're, you, you, the, that belong supposedly to a community to which you do not belong by virtue of your identity. There was a fascinating, uh, for instance, although, you know, to my opinion, profoundly depressing incident um, a couple of years ago when there was a poem that was published in The Nation, which is, of course, one of the uh, you know, leading progressive magazines that was written in the voice of a homeless Black woman. Uh, who was speaking in the sort of African-American vernacular. And then uh, people took offense because the author of this poem uh, is a white male. And, you know, the, the fact that he was trying to draw attention to the plight of this person in whose voice he was speaking in the poem was completely irrelevant. It was basically, you know, you're stealing the voice of a black woman. And of course, he wasn't stealing anything from anyone. It's not like, you know, he, he took a poem that was actually written by a homeless black woman and published it under his name. But the, this idea that speech somehow, you know, causes this profound harm to certain communities, even, and we're not, again, talking about speech that demonizes or attacks those communities, we're talking sometimes about speech that supports them in the wrong way. So, you know, I think that is a really um, fascinating and, and really disturbing phenomenon. Um, so I don't know if that directly answers your question, but, uh, yes, you know, as a writer, that is certainly one of my concerns. <laughs> yes, thank you, Kathy. And, and I guess I would like to then shift back to Andrew specifically around this idea then of what is permissible and what is not permissible and, and even share if you're comfortable, you know, what you're seeing in your own community and in your own leadership as part of the challenges around that discourse in the Jewish community, um, of course, with the lightning rod that Israel often is. Yeah, so within the Jewish communal world and uh, the Federation world, there's just tremendous uh, uh, fear about you know, about weighing in and talking about, honestly about boy I don't like Netanyahu or I don't like the Labor Party or I don't like a set of policies and if you say that out loud you can it's it's a little less but well it, it, it ebbs and flows but you are accused of being anti-Semitic I remember when I took the job at the Federation in 2012 coming from an academic point of view and there was the rocket attacks and oh, look we condemned them I went on video and I they were terrible it's Hamas it's terrorism let's be clear about that there's no excuse for them and as a political scientist I was saying huh I wonder sort of is this a political ploy by Netanyahu to poke it to keep keep them in power etc which by the way is part of what politicians do and so I began to think that the problem the challenge was really was showing that the American Jewish community uh, didn't have a grounding about why we should support Israel, but we, uh, it, you can think about this in terms of why we support the United States. Nobody thinks that the support for America depends on your support of Donald Trump or Barack Obama or Joe Biden. It depends on your support for the core values of America. And I think the American Jewish community has lost a sense of what those core values of Israel are. And the core values being the self-defense of the Jewish people, the flourishing of our people and our culture, and doing so by managing a government that treats all with a sense of justice and human rights and equality. And all three of those, not one, not two, and not three. You can't have one, but not the other two. You have to have all three. And those are the core values of Israel. And we can proudly support that. And we can think the Labor Party's out to lunch. And by the way, one of our graduates is now a member of the Knesset and Labor Party. So just to be clear, or we can think Netanyahu and his coalition are crazy. We can think the policies are bad. We can look at political opportunism. Um, and we should be able to say that if we care about a, a strong 
Jewish community. I, I would, Rachel, at a point, I don't want to carry on because you have other pieces. I would like to go back to Kathy's point about language, because I think there's a really important Jewish analog from our tradition and text. Uh, so at some point, we can come back to that if you'd like. No, please, let's do that right now. Please. Okay, so uh, within HUC, which is, you know, I've been here a little over two years, what I'm seeing now is a real chill and concern by faculty that they are walking on eggshells in the classroom because of the public voice that our students feel and good for them for having the agency. Let's just begin with that. Good for them for having the courage to speak truth to power. That's part of our prophetic tradition. And we need to ensure that what happens in the classroom does not close down our professors and close down dialogue, particularly in a protected space. And the way that I think about it is the fundamental lack of charitability that we have around language. And our tradition teaches us a number of stories about language, but the two that I think are most important. What's happening now, as Kathy's talking about, is people are using language and, they, and it's changing quickly and it means different things to different people. So one story we have when that happened was, of course, the Tower of Babel. And you can imagine the building, the tower straight up and the workers are there and boom, lightning strikes. They don't understand each other. And what happens, one worker says to the other, pass the bricks. And the other worker thinks he says, ugh, or some incomprehensible speech. And what do they do? They shrug. And as the, as the Tanakh makes clear, they go off separately and peacefully. They don't understand each other and that's okay. And they, they move outside. That's case number one, charitable. They, they respect each other's humanity, but they live apart. Okay, number two, in the book of Judges, you have the story of the Shibboleth. What is the Shibboleth? It is when the Gileadites are living next to their enemies and they share, they can't tell one from the other because they look the same, and, but one, one tribe cannot pronounce the sh sound and they say Shibboleth. And so they use language not to communicate, not to build bridges, not to form community. They use language as a signal of, are you with us or are you against us? And what is happening today with cancel culture is language is being used not to see that there's, we don't understand each other. Let's figure it out. Let's, let's recognize our humanity. It is using that language as a signal of, are you friend, are you foe in a Manichaean way that creates conflict and divisiveness rather than opportunity to learn from each other and to grow in a public spirited way. And that to me is the most concerning as the president of Hebrew Union College. Yeah, so Erwin, yeah, Erwin, go right ahead. I, I, I don't want to position you defending uh, cancel culture because I don't think it's that. I think actually who benefits from cancel culture is a really important question. And who benefits by our talking about cancel culture uh, is also an important uh, question. So when we ask what language is permitted, when we ask boundary questions, there is no definitive answer. It's an ongoing, we're always boundarying and deboundarying. We're permitting and we're prohibiting. In fact, um, it, one of the great texts of the Talmud in a moment of great and significant change in which the Jewish people are trying to figure out who they are again, post-destruction of the temple, but before sort of rabbinic Judaism has grabbed hold, there's, there's a great sage, Rabbi Meir, and he's considered Meir enlightened. He's rabbi enlightened. So it's really a story about the Jewish definition of enlightenment. And, and it says he could give 49 reasons why something was permitted, and 49 reasons why, for why that exact same thing is prohibited. And that is a prescription for a mainstream. And if the mainstream, whatever that mainstream is, all the way up and all the way down the ladder, because marginalized communities are not monolithic either. So Kathy is of course right that within the LGBTQT community, that's not a, that is, collectively a marginalized community, but in that community, there are also power arrangements because the differentials of power, who gets to speak, who gets to decide what words mean, who gets to draw the line on what's permitted, on who gets what, that's an ongoing debate up and down the systems. And, and now because systems are fractured, and, and Andrew is right that, we're, that, that we're, we're losing a sort of social fabric, that's for sure right, that because systems are fragile, you're gonna have in every single we, and that was the opening question was who was the we? 
every single we, big we's, small we's, marginal we's, powerful we's, in every we, you're going to have the, a range of opinion and a range of wanting to boundary and border things differently. So we have to open that up. Now, in terms of, in, of, the, in terms of the mainstream, the problem with the mainstream community is that right now it doesn't, we don't have the tools to, we don't have the tools, literally the tools, right? Nor have we trained the leadership to be able to, especially when we're talking about a federation community, right? They don't have the tools to be able to hold together a wider range of views. And it's completely understandable why they don't. And we didn't, we Jewish professionals surely didn't prepare them. There is no Israel education. The, a person 60 to 80 who was a major funder, who, who has been entitled to power by virtue of their, of their funding and their time, some of them, have a specific view regarding Israel that is deeply embedded in their biography, deeply embedded in their emotional lives. It is real, right? And to expect them, we haven't trained them, we haven't, we don't know how to do it, to train them to like open up to a little more critique. That's a very big job. So no, and, and it's sad because what they want most is to engage the next generation and they can't engage the next generation because the pluralism required to do that psychically, right? Is so different from what they grew up in. But the healthy thing that happens in communities is new things emerge at the edges. And that is how culture grows. Culture never grows from the center out. Culture grows from the edge in and edges edge in. And then they insinuate themselves in a new words and new, new power arrangements. And, and it's always problematic. It's always nasty in some ways. And my last point is, this is fundamentally about social change. Cancel culture is a toxic, presently, toxic tool in social change. And in social change, there are always innovators of the social change, early adopters of the social change, early majority, late majority, and laggards in the social change. And the most important thing is to know who you are in that drama. And here's where I, I there's something Andrew said that I think is important for students to understand. There ought to be costs to be an innovator, just like there's costs to be a laggard. And right now, there are no costs for the, and here I'm gonna be against cancel culture. There are no fundamental costs for the punitive, nasty, shaming, uh, unforgiving pieces of cancel culture. And forgiveness, if you're gonna have canceling, you have to have forgiveness. And right now there is no forgiveness in the culture at all. So, so before I open it up to some of the questions that we're starting to receive from the audience, I want to ask each of you, um, in the spirit of thinking about how we um, reweave the social fabric, the tapestry of the American discourse or the American Jewish discourse, whichever you prefer to focus on, and what specific tool or tools do you say in a very practical way for people listening, not in a theoretical abstract way, but what are the, the tools needed in order to be able to actually construct productive discomfort and engage with complexity, with layers, with nuance, not because you ultimately have to agree to a certain policy or position, but because you are creating brave spaces and cultivating opportunities to build bridges ideologically across divisions rather than remain in these fissures or silos that we see playing out, whether again, in our social media feeds or in real life. So Kathy, let's start with you about name one to two practical tools and then we'll go to Andrew and then Erwin. Well, I, I think one um, thing that we could just adopt that I think would help tremendously is uh, to just look more thoughtfully at these situations and not, you know, to try to 
avoid the rush to judgment. And I know that's easier said than done, but I think that would definitely help. I think that it would help to have, you know, more maybe like sort of first responder sites that would look at these, uh, you know, council situations that arise and try to provide a fact check. Because a lot of the time, you know, I think a lot of the time these responses really do proceed based on very inadequate knowledge of the facts. And I do want to say, you know, I don't want to take up any more time, but I do want to respond briefly to something that um, that was said before about uh, sort of most of these, uh, most of the people uh, who get counseled, uh, I think Irvin said this, sort of rebounding and maybe ending up better off than before. I would suggest that maybe those are the cases that we know about, and maybe like those are the cases that we know about because those people are doing fine, or like they're too big to counsel, like, um, you know, Andrew Sullivan or Barry White both of whom have a tremendous following. Um, and I, I don't want to, again, take up the time by uh, rattling off more cases, but I can assure you that there are cases of people who really do end up in a very bad situation because, uh, because they, they essentially are subjected to ostracism uh, related to either something they did, uh, perhaps you know five years ago that wasn't a violation of a social norm then, but as one now, or because they said something that was misinterpreted um, I, and I mean, I, I'm glad I, that I think we all agree that this is a toxic culture. And I think that's, you know, we need to find ways to overcome the toxicity. And you can't really have a negotiation of social norms if, you know, half or two thirds of the people in this negotiation are afraid to say what they think because they know that it's going to have serious repercussions. And I think that's what I'd like to leave us with that, you know, to negotiate, you need people to be able to speak freely. Thank you, Kathy. Andrew. Yeah, I'll, I'll be really brief. First of all, I'm only talking about the ideological space, not the behavioral piece. So the two tips for uh, ideology, number one, a presumption of charitability with your speaker. We are triggered and ready to go at the, at the jugular and particularly a charity towards those uh, that, that otherwise you are ready to hear the worst from them because of how they look or how they act. It's no different than how we, how we label people, number one. Number two, to, to rise up, to, to bring up and to raise up the, the reminder of people that words only have the power that we choose to give to them. Words only have the power that we choose to give to them. There's no abracadabra. There's no, there's no magic that we spell. And we are choosing to receive language from others in ways that is provocative, in ideas that we think mean something. So much of the Israel debate, for example, had a look at the Iran debate in 2015, the summer. The disagreements there, by and large, were not about whether you wanted Israel to exist or whether you wanted Israel to lead, they were about what is the best way to ensure Israel's existence. And that's the charitability. Words don't have power except what we give to them, those, those two things. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And Erwin. Yeah, so I have uh, three things. One is we desperately need social media literacy and how it is that we are being manipulated. This is this cancel culture is a very significant benefit, right? It is, a, it is a consequence of real decisions by people bigger than people doing the canceling. That is, and people are losing their freedom over this. So social media literacy, and in general, cognitive bias literacy, which needs to be re in, in, integrated into a variety of different curricula and different spaces. That's one. Two, people in their particular spheres of influence and wherever they are in the food chain and wherever they are in the polarization continuum, they have to have courage to take on their own extremes. There is no possibility of a person from the right correcting or helping account for people on the left and vice versa. So if you are a, a, a super pro-hawk, uh, uh, pro-Israel kind of person, right? You have to be a leader in your space ensuring that people who are, have your political views, who do cancel others, don't do that. They can argue that. So we need what I call a sort of a cadre of emerging leaders in every individual space to hold on to, to hold, and that means if you care about this, to hold their extremes accountable for canceling. 
And the third thing is people who experience themselves as pluralists, and that's a very small group, but we need to create a much larger group of people like that in American Jewish leadership and in America in general. We need, just like there were early moral, just like there are early technology adopters, just like there are innovators in the technology space, we need early pluralism adopters. These are people who will, they will go down in history and they will be able to answer to their God saying, listen, here's what I advocated every day in my life, right? I advocated for a more pluralist and develop the skills and technologies of pluralism. And, and then what will happen is cancel culture will simply become a dark side of an awakening. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. I want to open it up to some of the questions that were being sent from our audience. And one of the questions that is being asked is, um, you know, one of the audience members says, I've noticed that cancel culture can create chaos and can be very divisive and, dis and distracting. Could a small part of our current increase of cancel culture be from trolls, from foreign adversaries, in order to inflame the current divisions within America. What else is truly causing the canceling that we are seeing play out now? Andrew, do you wanna jump on that yeah, one first? Well, first of all, I think there's a lot of documented evidence that is what's happening. But I would say to the question, that's a terrific question, it's very important. That explains the source of the poking. What it doesn't explain is why the reaction is what it is. And it's the reaction that is really the cancel culture that we have, the idea that words have power, but they only have the power. What if we ignored it? Are you serious? The pizza stuff and the, the stuff with Clinton? I mean, what the heck would, who, who took that seriously? Well, a lot of people did. They were looking at that kind of trolling and they, they responded to it. Um, so that's the answer. I won't, I won't belabor the point. Thank you. Kathy, this question is specifically for you, again, with your, your background as a writer. And, and the question here is the question of, um, is it reasonable to expect authors from previous times to comply with the modern standards that have been set today, particularly around societal norms, these issues around how um, communities are or are not identified, um, whether it's you know, accepted speech, how do we actually engage those who are coming from a very different context when we are reading it or engaging with it today? All right. Well, I'm not sure whether the question refers to like authors who are currently active, but were raised in a different time and were, whose writing sort of reflects the viewpoints of, you know, the day of the days of their youth or, you know, the days when they came of age, or are we talking about engaging with literature from, you know, 100, 200 years ago? So, because I think that's a, that's an important distinction. Um, I mean, in terms of um, writing, from, uh, you know, older generations, and I suppose, you know, these days, you know, at this point, that's me, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not exactly a spring chicken. Uh, I mean, I remember the first round of the, the sort of political correctness wars in the 1990s, and that was, uh, you know, I was already writing about it then. Um, I think that uh, th th there's a peculiar kind of, you um, uh, ageism really, which is interesting because of course ageism is supposed to be, you know, one of the sins of, uh, you know, prejudice and bigotry and yet it has become a really kind of routine for these for, for the young social justice activists to basically dismiss the ideas of anyone who is I mean it's kind of like the old you know never trust anyone over 30 right was that Abby Hoffman I don't remember uh, but you know that was from a very different generation but there is definitely this idea that oh you know you're you're over 30 you know in the you, yeah, especially over 50, you know, you're, you're really over the hill and your ideas are hopelessly old fashioned. And I think that's an extremely, um, and I'm obviously saying that in a self-interested way, but you know, that's an extremely 
uh, not only uncharitable, but very unhelpful way of looking at things because, you know, older generations, um, I mean, new ideas are not necessarily better in every way. You know, obviously in, you know, some changes that have taken place are clearly for the better, uh, but it doesn't automatically follow that every new idea is good. And maybe, you know, maybe in some ways, uh, older people and older writers um, have the experience and the, uh, you know, the, the sort of the life experience of uh, knowing, for instance, about previous cycles of political radicalism and how they turned out and uh, you know, being able to bring that wisdom um, to the events of today. So I think it's definitely helpful not to you know, write off someone's uh, viewpoints uh, based on the fact that they come from a different generation. Um, and I think, you know, likewise, when we engage um, the writers from 100, 200 years ago, it's very easy to see, you know, ways in which, of course, their ideas about many things, including, for instance, the role of women, uh, including, generally speaking, attitudes towards racial and ethnic minorities are in some ways hopelessly outdated. But do we focus on that? And do we say that because of that, their work has no value and their insights about other things have no value? Or do we look for things uh, where they do have insight? And I think that's uh, uh, th that's what I would recommend. And I mean, personally, one thing that I think is really interesting uh, in terms of, of, for instance, looking at uh, even dialogue about Jewish issues, you know, many things that were being discussed, uh, you know, 100, 200 years ago are actually still relevant. If you look at some of the uh, dialogues from the early days of Zionism, for instance, and uh, where Jews fit into the community and the diaspora versus, uh, you know, uh, having having a national identity as a country uh, in Israel. A lot of that is actually still quite relevant. Um, so a lot of what was written about feminism, you know, 150 years ago, really has more relevancy than we imagine. Uh, even though the, the the actual situation of women obviously has changed in many many ways. Um, you know, so I think the 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 answer that I and this would probably tie into what Andra said about uh, the principle of charity. I think we have to apply that same principle to things that were said and written in, pre in previous generations and maybe sometimes, uh, you know, be pleasantly surprised by how advanced some people's ideas were at the time when those ideas, uh, you know, those advanced ideas were really not in the mainstream. So that would be my, my recommendation. Thank you. Andrew, would you like to add to Kathy's comments? Yeah, and I so appreciate what Kathy had to say here. Um, I, I distinguish between the behavioral cancellation, cancelization for bad behavior, and cancelization for offensive behavior and offensive ideas. There's a logic to cancel culture where offensive behavior leads to canceling of the person. You don't want to associate them. We don't want to employ them. That, that, there's a logic there, whether you support it or not. There's a logic between offensive ideas and not reading or picking up a book because you, you don't want to be exposed to that or they're really offensive and bad. But there's a jumping that happens that I think is particularly concerning when bad behavior leads to the canceling of ideas that otherwise seem just fine. And to give you the example that would make it, really, I mean, we can point to any number of examples today, but that one of the challenges is the art and the artist point. It's the great Wagner question. Do you, you know, and that, that what was the what was the art used for, and do you cancel it? And what was he, et cetera? But the, the 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 example of Martin Luther King comes to mind. Are his ideas wrong because of his ethical uh, lapses that are now public and well known, and we don't have to document, but we can we can recognize them. His bad behavior, his offensive behavior, uh, his inappropriate behavior does not in my view, but I'm a, a theorist, cancel the ideas that he had that has to stand on their own. And I would just say, if we do think that offensive behavior means that we have to cancel ideas, I really am afraid that much of our Jewish text, much of our Jewish tradition, we have to presume is verboten because these people were people, they were human beings, they were scholarly, they were wise, they were spiritually elevated, but that does not mean they were perfect. And the idea that the dozens, the scores, the hundreds of Jewish authors of the most sacred texts that we have did not exhibit the same kind of human frailty that all of us do 
is beyond uh, any kind of, uh, of reality that I can imagine. So let's stop jumping from offensive behavior to canceling of ideas, even if you subscribe to cancel culture. Yeah, I, I want to double down on that because I think that this is where there's probably agreement between the three of us on this in it. In it. I'm much less concerned about cancel culture than, than Andrew or Kathy for a variety of reasons, but it strikes me that if you are involved in cancel culture, you ought to ask seriously, are you getting the job you want done? Because shaming others, canceling others for ideas, and I think the ideas and behavioral distinction is critical, shaming others in a purely punitive way we know is about spectacle, attention, self-aggrandizement, and not about the serious political, economic, and social and psychological transformations we want. And I think that is what at some, I hate to use the word essential, way, at least rabbinic Judaism, deeply understood. They could curse each other in the Talmud. They could throw invectives against each other. But the ideas were allowed to play out against each other because the only way to move towards the truth is in this ongoing confrontational, ferociously curious way about each other's ideas. And, and maybe that's what's missing from cancel culture, a ferocious curiosity in the lived experiences of other people. Instead, there seems to be a real fear. And I get the fear for uh, marginalized people, I do get it, but, but that fear that translates in to the toxic cancel culture all it really does is it radicalizes the people's beliefs, it widens divides that are already growing, it deepens polarization. Maybe you get off by getting a few more likes and you get off by having some sort of sort of a, attention and what we call kind of social prestige because this is a social contagion. So you get social prestige, but what it is you want to have happen, at least judging the people doing cancel culture at their best. What they want is social transformation. There is no possibility for cancel culture to lead to social transformation. So let me ask you all as our final question, as, as you can imagine, I, I'm seeing a lot of questions related to the recent crisis between Israel and Palestinians. And the question here without diving into the recent crisis really is a question around misinformation or disinformation and how that plays into a uh, cancel culture, both you know, specifically to that issue that we just saw the last 12 days and more you know, broadly speaking. So you know, how is misinformation and disinformation playing a role in cancel culture specifically related to the Israel-Palestine conversation as we see in both social media and larger media, whether it's Trevor Noah, John Oliver, you pick whoever you would like to think you know, as the, as the model or, or prototype in your head. And also then more broadly, how misinformation campaigns, disinformation can exacerbate cancel culture. So any of you want to jump on that? Well, you know, if I can uh, very briefly chime in here, uh, I think one of the things that, that I find really interesting about the conversation around Israel is that this is an area in which both sides accuse each other of, <laughs> um, of having a cancel yeah. culture. Uh, because just recently, there have been two incidents in which, you know, I have seen actually claims that like, there is no other area in which cancel culture works as sort of ferociously as it does toward critics of Israel, which, you know, I, I think is very very, very exaggerated. Uh, but there was one incident in particular in which a young woman uh, named Emily Wilder, who is uh, or was a member of Students for Justice in Palestine, uh, was uh, fired from her uh, job, which she had just started with the Associated Press after um, a conservative campus group, which had been sort of at odds with SJP at Stanford, uh, brought attention to some of her tweets. Um, and 
and uh, a, a lot of people felt that this was really a kind of uh, political hit. And it, it, to some extent, it was really targeting the Associated Press because there was a, that whole controversy about, you know, did they know that they possibly shared an office building with a Hamas unit in Gaza and so on. So there was that. There was another incident at the University of Toronto in which uh, a, um, a human rights clinic uh, director's job offer was revoked uh, because of a donor's concerns, apparently, about some of her uh, writings or very sort of strongly pro-Palestinian writings, which, you know, some said that they were sort of obsessively anti-Israel. And then on, on the other side, you have a lot of people saying that on college campuses today, uh, it is uh, Zionist students uh, who are being subjected to kind of ostracism. And there's a, the, the, there's a sort of attitude that if you're a Zionist, you sort of identify with the oppressor. And of course, it's complicated because there, there is some very sort of cancel rhetoric on both sides of this. Because for instance, if you look at uh, the rhetoric that Students for Justice in Palestine uses, and I'm not saying, by the way, that Emily Waters should have lost her job, but, you know, SJP has tried to get Hillel canceled, for instance. They tried to get Hillel on several campuses kicked out of campus fairs because, you know, they make Palestinian students unsafe, or you know, they, they've distributed literature saying that if you're a Zionist, you know, someday people will see you the way that we see the sort of the racist grandpa today, or the way that we see white supremacists and KKK members. So I think there's a lot of um, uh, the, there's a lot of very uh, polarizing rhetoric, obviously, on both sides. And again, you know, I, and I think you can actually find examples of sort of council culture on both sides of this, because we're talking about different milieus, you know, we're talking about some of the more traditional Jewish, uh, you know, establishment circles in which, as Andrew was saying, you know, it has been uh, almost verboten, verboten uh, at times to criticize the current leadership of Israel and so on. Uh, but, you know, I think that has been changing because, you know, even Barry Weiss, who's an extremely strong advocate of Israel, has said that she believes, uh, you know, a lot of Netanyahu's uh, policies are racist and that, you know, she was sort of appalled by his alliance with some of the anti-Arab parties. So I think that really has been changing. And, you know, I do think that in some of the younger sort of social justice circles, uh, there really is a great stigma attached to being a Zionist. If you look at some of the controversy in the Women's March, for instance, which really kind of fell apart because of this. Uh, Jewish women were sort of almost required to pledge uh, that they were not supporters of Zionism and they were being associated with white supremacy and white privilege if they were Zionists. So I think that's, you know, I mean, that, I think that's really a kind of prime example of how toxic the conversation can become when uh, you have sort of two opposing groups uh, that are kind of constantly trying to cancel each other instead of having a dialogue and trying to understand where the other is coming from. And, you know, uh, so, so we really have this sort of clash between on the one hand, you know, some people saying that if you criticize, you know, if you're not totally on board with everything that Netanyahu does, you're anti-Semitic. And then it's like, you know, if you if you're not on board with, you know, every single goal of Palestinian liberation, uh, you're a white supremacist. And of course, you know, that's an extremely simplistic approach. Uh, and, and I think so, so really that is almost kind of a, a cautionary tale in how bad, you know, cancel culture can get when it replaces dialogue. Thank wow. you, Kathy. Very, very quickly, Erwin and Andrew. Oh, wow, I mean, what Kathy's right on. This is an opportunity then, when you see this sort of extremism, this is an opportunity for leadership. And wherever that leadership is gonna come from, whether that is Hillel, which needs to become more pluralist, whether it's federations that need to figure out how to become more pluralist, the, what we call the mainstream or what we call the umbrella organizations that are at the core of a social fabric. This is the opportunity for them to become more pluralist, but it takes incredible courage to become more pluralist. And it involves comparing your worst to their best. Instead, what we do is we compare our best views to someone else's worst views. And that's why we always win, as opposed to my best to your best with again, ferocious curiosity and courage. Thank you, Andrew. 
Yeah, that idea of ferocious, ferocious curiosity and courage is so critical. So I want to thank Erwin for raising it up. You asked the question, Rachel, how does misinformation and cancel culture interact? So I want to just be really clear about it. When cancel culture is operating, we're placing people's ideas into the category of who they are. And we're rejecting them, we're listening, we're triggered. And so we can never get to a point of correcting misinformation because I'm not asking the question, how good are your ideas? I'm asking the question, what judgment should I make about you? Right. And that doesn't foster the sense of, of progress. It doesn't foster a sense. And what, what, what Erwin talked about, about creating pluralist space, we do have many other institutions, but they're all separated and we need to come together. We need to build it. I just want to close by saying the one thing that I didn't say, and I wanted to begin with, I want to recognize I'm a white male with power, with influence in a very influential job in the Jewish community. And one of the things that I'm concerned about is that we are attentive to that, even in this dialogue. And it's just another reason to remind ourselves about the importance of diversity and inclusion of getting all kinds of people at the table. And so I'm glad that you did that, Rachel and Mark and uh, in this series, it's so critical in making sure that we are held, that we're all holding each other to the highest standards that we have. So thank you very much for, for being involved. So uh, before I hand over to Mark, I just want to thank you, Kathy, Andrew, and Erwin, for truly a stimulating conversation. This is not an easy topic. I think that all of us heard very clearly part of the charge that you are tasking each of us with who are listening is the idea to create and lead with questions rather than end our statements with exclamation points, engage in creating the brave spaces that we so need, and actually be willing to engage with challenging, complicated, nuanced discussion rather than um, creating and perpetuating political and polemical divisions. So Mark, I hand it over to you. Um, great, great segue, Rachel, and thank you. When the leadership of this JCC nine years ago imagined uh, hot buttons, cool conversations yeah. uh, and uh, created this series in, in memory of uh, a leader of our organization, Jonathan Seyman, who embodied that. He was an Ohev Shalom, Rodev Shalom. He was a, a pursuer of peace. And uh, I am thinking of him listening to this conversation because tonight is what we dreamed about. And the four of you have brought that to life. You've honored uh, our JCC, this topic and this conversation by your words uh, and your wisdom. And for that, all of us at the JCC, all of us who are plugged in tonight, all of us who are on the WGBH Forum Network, We'll, we'll plug into this recording and watch it uh, down the road. We are deeply, deeply grateful for your presence, your words, uh, your wisdom tonight. It was brilliant and enlightening. And to our audience, we promise if there are any controversial topics left to talk about in the fall, um, and there may be a few that remain, we promise to be back uh, with, the, with our series uh, and programs, hopefully that can rise to the level of this one uh, when we return in the fall. Thank you again, Rachel, Irwin, Andrew and Kathy for an absolutely brilliant evening. Thank you.